All right, you cool cats. Welcome back to the program. My name is Dr. Dan and I'm a pharmacist turned weight management specialist. Today we're doing part six of what I have officially decided is going to be a seven part series. In these final two sections, we're going to talk about how you can support your modern teenage brain in order to start modifying your habits and to start increasing your cognitive capacity. But before we jump into that, as always, I need you to hit that subscribe button down below so you don't miss the next episode and really any other episode that I now create as well. Turn on those notifications so you get the immediate update when it comes out. And of course, check me out on my other channels at the official Dr. Dan. We are on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook. We are out there. Check it out as well. Go to my website, healthcareevolved.ca in order to get the latest updates. And you can also sign up for my newsletter. So first off, if you don't even know what I'm talking about when I say the modern teenage brain or the old man primal brain, then you definitely need to go back and check out parts one through five. You can check them out here on my channel. They're entirely a separate series and go through each and every single one of them to get the most up-to-date info and to really understand what the heck we're going to be talking about here going forward. Now, I won't bullshit you. Today, we're going to talk about the hard stuff. It really is no easy feat changing your habits or increasing your cognitive capacity. If it was, you and I wouldn't be here right now. In fact, you would have changed your habits, you would have managed your weight, and then you would be skipping through a field full of unicorns and leprechauns. Now, while there will likely be a few unicorns and leprechauns prancing about in the upcoming Halloween celebrations, or potentially in the past Halloween celebrations, all depending on when this video actually gets dropped, I can assure you that they are not real, and unless you know who they are, I do not recommend skipping in a field with them. Anywho, in part six here, we're going to focus on habits. Now, habits are really a fickle pain in the ass. Now, as I've said before, habits are very important. I mean, they've served a very vital role in our survival and our advancement as a human species, but they're very challenging if the ineffective or wrong habits get created. You see, habits allow us to automate remedial tasks or problems and challenges that we encounter on a regular basis. This allows us to free up cognitive capacity and brain power in order to solve more complex problems. And maybe some of you recall my managing stress example that I gave in like part four or five. Some people to deal with stress, they eat chocolate and other people maybe go for a run. You see, both strategies ultimately solve the problem of helping to reduce the level of stress. But one strategy is going to probably lead to better health outcomes in the long term compared to the other strategy. And that's going to be the difference between an effective and an ineffective habit. Now, as a bit of an aside here, two books that I definitely recommend you check out if you want to learn more about habits and how you can go about changing them. Check out The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg and also check out Atomic Habits by James Clear. These books will go into a lot more information and a lot more detail compared to what I'm going to go over here in this video. So if you want more information, definitely check them out. And obviously what I'm talking about here today is not going to be all encompassing, but here's a few main points that I always look at when I'm working with my clients and my patients. So the basic structure of a habit is this right here. You have a cue, you have a behavior, and then you have the reward. And what we mean by this is the cue is like an environmental cue. There's something in your environment that triggers you to start acting on the behavior and to ultimately engage in the reward. So an environmental cue, for example, could be walking through the door as you come home from work. The behavior then could be raiding the pantry for a bag of chips or Oreo cookies. And the reward is not only eating the glorious chips or Oreos, whatever your pleasure might be, but it's also getting a reduction in your stress levels and getting a bit more relaxation because now your day is over. Now, this is a very simplified example, and obviously everyone's habits and structure of their habits are going to be a little bit different, but you kind of get the idea of what I'm going for here. And for a lot of people, the reward and the cue that leads to a specific habit and behavior isn't always going to be so easy to pull out. But just having this knowledge of the cue, behavior, reward kind of pathway that makes up a habit and makes up a behavior can provide you the knowledge and the insight to be able to be a little bit more in tune and have a little bit more insight into what your specific habits might be and starting to identify what might be your cues that are ultimately leading to a certain reward. So now that we know the structure of a habit, how can we ultimately use that to mitigate and manage our less effective habits? And one mistake that people often make is they try changing the behavior. So for example, they walk through the door from work and instead of going and raiding the pantry for a bag of chips, they go and try and have a salad or go do some other kind of activity. 
And while this approach might seem to make sense, and certainly is a, a noble attempt to start changing your habits and behaviors, I really can't say I know anybody where a salad has helped to reduce their stress. And in fact, a better place for us to actually start would be trying to identify what is our specific cue that ultimately leads to the behavior and the reward. You see, is it the act of walking through the door? Is it maybe when you open up the garage door and you park the car? Or maybe, maybe it's when you were back at the office and you were triggered and got that increase in stress level to begin with. You see, for a habit to occur, all three of the components need to be present. You need to have that cue, you need to have that behavior, and you need to have that reward. But if a cue is never presented, your brain is not going to spike your dopamine levels in anticipation of that reward that potentially will come. You see, if there's no anticipation, there's ultimately no wanting, therefore that behavior doesn't actually occur, and so you're not going to engage in that behavior because there's no potential for that reward. And maybe you've heard the story about Pavlov's dog, the dog that associated food with the ringing of the bell. You see, when there was no bell, there was no cue, and therefore there was no dog drooling all over the floor. And while that all seems simple enough, just remove the cue, the habit doesn't happen, and all your life's problems are solved. However, as I said before, it's not always easy to just identify your cue, and then it's also not just easy to just change your cue either. I mean, do you never go to work again, so you're never coming home from a stressful day at work and walking through the door? Or how do you go about never walking through the door of your house ever again? Obviously, neither option in this situation is very easy to do or let alone very practical. And this also assumes that walking through the door is the cue that triggers you to go and snack and eat some food. Regardless, the process really starts with identifying what is the cue, what is the specific thing that leads to the behavior and ultimately the reward. And once you identify that, then you can start to brainstorm and find ways that maybe you can mitigate and modify it. And in some situations, it might be as simple as walking through a different door when you get home. So instead of going through the front door, you go through the back door. Or once you park the car, you throw on your runners and go for a walk. And that helps to relieve your stress instead of going inside and snacking on something. Now, on the flip side, we don't necessarily need to start by changing old habits. We can start by implementing new habits. So let's take a little look at this. Let's say you wanted to start by lifting weights. So that's going to be your new behavior. But currently, you're not going to the gym at all. Now, to suddenly go from no gym whatsoever in your life to, say, going to the gym four times a week for an hour each session and lifting weights, that's going to be a lot of work. That's going to be a huge leap. We have our intention, which is to lift weights, and then we have the actual behavior. There is a huge gap between those at present. There is going to be so many changes that you need to implement in your life in order to bridge that intention and behavior gap. You're going to have to allocate the time to actually go. You're going to have to get an actual gym membership. You're going to have to pack your gym clothes. You might have to adjust your routine depending on where you're going. If it's in the morning, you're going to have to get up earlier. If it's in the evening, you're going to have to adjust your evening schedule and you're going to have to go to bed at a different time. There's going to be so many things that you need to implement and adopt before you even get up to that four times a week for one hour lifting weights. So it's going to be a lot of changes and a lot of resistance and friction that you're going to need to fight against. You see, you're not just throwing a wrench into your proverbial engine of life. You are literally throwing a grenade into that engine and just waiting for it to blow up. And for 99% of people, this ambitious goal is really going to be nothing but a pile of ashes by the end of the week. So what I'm going to propose is that instead of throwing a grenade into that engine, how about we just start by putting in a bad spark plug? The engine is essentially still going to run. It's just not going to be as efficient as maybe we'd like it to be. And that's okay. We can increase that efficiency. We can make it optimized down the road. And so an example of doing this might be just starting by showing up at the gym, literally going there for five minutes, maybe not even going in, but driving to the parking lot or even going for, say, a walk at the pre-specified time that you plan to eventually go to the gym during. You see, this is starting small and easy and just starting to create the habit. And again, if you remember from parts one through five, your brain is composed of a whiny teenager and a stubborn old man. Do you think either of them really wants to work that hard? So instead of going from a zero to 100, maybe we start by just kind of getting them off the couch and just getting a little bit of movement, something very subtle, something very easy. 
And over time, they're going to be kind of either A, expecting to go to the gym or do something at this specific time, or they'll actually maybe start to enjoy and start to say, hey, let's go for said walk or let's do this or let's show up here. And what's honestly likely going to happen at that point in time is that when you go out for that walk or when you just show up to that gym, you're probably going to get inspired and saying, well, shit, we're here anyways, let's go do something. Now we have that ball rolling and now it's about repeating it again and again and eventually it's going to become automatic if you repeat it enough times. And now you can start building it from that one session 20 minutes once a week to say those four sessions each week lifting weights for an hour. Now how many times do you need to repeat this before it becomes automatic? We honestly don't really know. A lot of gurus and the IG influencers and all my favorite people in the world will tell you it takes 21 days or it takes X amount of time. But there really is no pre-specified amount of time where your brain just goes, all right, it's automatic now. It's, it's going to vary person to person. And so just being mindful and aware of that is an important component of this. But ultimately, what's going to happen is that at first, you're going to use a lot of brain power. And over time, you're going to use less and less brain power in order to engage in that new habit and that new behavior. And the final piece that I want to talk about here is, well, life. Because as much as you have the intentions of lifting weights, reducing your snacking, doing X, Y, and Z, or tuning into my YouTube videos every single week... Seriously, though, if you do enjoy my YouTube videos, please spread them far and wide. Tell your friends, subscribe down below. And if you don't enjoy them, well, don't tell your friends and please shoot me a message and I may or may not do something with said feedback. Anyways, even though you have the best intentions, life does not stop. Life does not just take a vacation while you work on your habits and do what you need to do. No, unfortunately, life is always going to be there to shit on your progress at the perfect time. So we need to plan for it, or at the very least, we need to think about the possibilities of what could go wrong. So you forget your gym bag at home. All right, well, we can't go to the gym. Well, what else can we do? Maybe we can go for a walk. Maybe we can do X, Y, and Z, whatever. Have some other kind of backup plan in that situation. Forgot to pack your lunch? Okay, what are some healthy options that we could get for takeout that are around our office? Or if you live in Canada like I do, you are pretty much guaranteed there's going to be at least one or two massive snowfalls and eventually for about a week in February, the temperatures are going to reach sub-Arctic levels and ultimately that outdoor workout you're doing might not be feasible. So what are you going to do instead? Do we have a thick enough parka or maybe instead of being a sociopath, we can look at doing a workout indoors? As the old adage goes, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So motivating your teenage modern brain is a process. It takes continued effort and practice. And despite all the planning, despite all the great habits that you're trying to implement and all the amazing intentions you have, you are still going to fail. That teenager of yours is not going to get off the couch some days and go and find a job. But that is okay. We really want to focus on these failures and these letdowns and stuff like that as more of a learning opportunity. What can we do better or what can we do differently next time? Maybe instead of poking them with a broom handle, we use an actual cattle prod or perhaps we cut off their allowance. So suddenly they have to go get a job if they want to do anything. And at times it's going to be painful and sometimes it's going to just suck. But that's kind of the beautiful thing about life is that we have this opportunity to continuously be learning, to try new things, and to see what ultimately works for us. And I mean, fundamentally, this is what brings us joy and happiness in life. It is the solving of problems and ultimately upgrading to more better problems, if you will. Reaching your goals is great, but continually solving problems and getting to solve better problems as you go through life is really where the magic happens. So that is part six, you beautiful people, and this one was certainly a little bit longer than I was expecting, hence why we broke this one into two sections. In part seven, I'm going to talk to you about how you can increase that cognitive capacity and get that teenage brain to have a little bit more energy throughout the day. Fundamentally, with increased cognitive capacity, it can make the stuff that I've talked about in parts five and six a little bit more manageable and really hopefully make things a bit more easier for you. So be sure to tune in and check it out. And as always, don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below. And of course, check me out on my other channels at The Official Dr. Dan. I'm on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, you name it. As well, check out the website healthcareevolve.ca where you can book a free consult with myself if you would like some additional support and help for one-on-one -on -one coaching. 
And finally, always remember that small tweaks lead to massive peaks. <laughs>